Okay, so <clears throat> this is the title of my uh, presentation, Nature, A Historicity and Environmental Ethics. A um, couple of things about my background. I work, so my main field of uh, um, research, my main area of interest is um, Tokugawa period um, Japanese philosophy. I'm particularly interest in, interested in the concept of nature. I've been working a lot on Ando Shoiki. I will be talking about him today as well, a little, a little bit, um, but also as other philosophers like Yamagata Banto and so on and so forth. And recently I've started to develop an interest in um, environmental ethics and uh, deep ecology. Uh, and to me, they are connected. So, um, Edo period Japanese philosophy and environmental ethics are, there are a lot of connections there. And the um, project that I want to talk about today is something that is still work in progress. I've just started working on this. So rather than findings and conclusions of this project, I'll, uh, I'll try and share some of the, the questions, some of the ideas that I have. Um, I might not be very articulate because I'm at that stage where I think I know I'm onto something, but it hasn't crystallized yet well enough for me to be able to uh, explain it in a, in a coherent way. So please bear with me for the next uh, 20 minutes. So um, I'm going to just start with the, uh, with the first thing. Uh, skip the any other introduction and talk a little bit about uh, deep ecology because I want to come back to deep ecology uh, at the end. So um, very, very briefly, um, Arne Ness, um, the Norwegian philosopher who came up with the concept of uh, deep ecology, uh, he talks about uh, things like the unity of all living things, uh, feeling for nature, the importance of emotions. He comes up, if you remember, with the, the notion of ecosophy, and he even talks about ecosophy tea, which is his own ecosophy based on his relationship with a mountain in, in Norway and so on and so forth. And he builds on works by Aldo Leopold, his land ethic, and Rachel Carson, and so on and so forth. Now, probably the most famous thing about Arne and the deep um, uh, ecology movement is the list of the eight points that um, Arne proposes. And he insists, insists that deep ecology is a platform for debate. It's not a set of principles. It's not a set of, uh, of rules, but it's more like a, um, a platform of ideas that are uh, up for grabs, that are debatable, that uh, people are invited to engage with. And that's exactly what I'm planning to do today. So just as a short recap, these are the eight, uh, uh, eight points. I'm not going to go through uh, all of them. Um, just a couple of uh, comments about, uh, about the eight points. Uh, for example, the, uh, the quote that I have here, so the eight points that I have here, they're taken from uh, a book that was translated into English in 2002, but actually it dates from 1998. So it's relatively, if I remember correctly, so it's relatively late in Ness's career, which means that some of the principles are a little bit altered. Um, for example, number six, uh, the one right now looks like, uh, so in the 2002 is, um, edition, he talks about decisive improvement requires considerable changes, social, economical, technological, ideological. In the earlier version or some of the earlier versions of, uh, of this principle, he was talking about um, policymakers and making policymakers aware of these uh, changes, but uh, somewhere along the way he gave up um, uh, the appeal to the idea of appealing to policymakers or policymakers only. Um, some other um, points are a little bit unclear or problematic, I would say, uh, for discussion. For example, at number three, he talks about uh, vital needs. Except to satisfy vital needs, mankind does not have the right to reduce this diversity and this richness. But it's, of course, um, what exactly are these vital needs and who gets to decide these vital needs? Is there a set of universal vital needs? Do they differ from area to area and so on and so forth? Um, another example would be that at number seven, he talks about um, quality of life, seeking a better quality of life rather than a raised standard of living. But again, it's not very clear what he means by quality of life, what is uh, included in this. Um, I mean, we, we kind of... 
understand we kind of figure it, it we're able to imagine what he means by this but it's 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 never clear and so on and so forth so um as a platform as a set of ideas that are up for debate i am on board so, so to say um, i take number eight seriously so i feel responsibility i'm trying to contribute indirectly for these uh, changes but today i'd like to focus on uh, two of these uh, points specifically number five and number six five which says today the extent and nature of human interference in the various ecosystems are not sustainable and the lack of sustainability is rising in point six as i said earlier decisive improvement requires considerable changes social economic technological and ideological and uh, from these, uh, in, within these two uh, points from RNS's uh, list, I would like to focus on two keywords, which are today and ideological. And I'd like to respond a little bit to um, RNS, make some comments, uh, and try to make a small contribution, um, an addendum to to these uh, to these points. Okay, and to do that, I look at uh, Shoeki, Ando Shoeki and his legacy, Shoeki, who is an 18th uh, century uh, Japanese thinker, philosopher, practically un unknown for almost two centuries until he's rediscovered in the, uh, in the Meiji period, a very a sort of mysterious figure because we don't know uh, a lot about his life and he was never part of any of the major uh, schools of, uh, of thought in Japan at the time and he criticizes the uh, major philosophical uh, traditions. His main work is Shizenshin Edo, uh, and in that he proposes, and I would like to focus on this, he proposes uh, a vision of the world, of the universe, where you have two different uh, realms. The first one would be what he calls Shizen no Yo, uh, the world of nature, which would be this sort of primordial, pristine nature that lives according to its own door according to its own way and uh the other realm is the so-called what he calls shihose which is the world of the private law which basically is another term to refer to human uh society and i'd like to look um to focus um on the first one the shizen no yo uh with a couple of um references to the second one to the world of uh private law so here's how he defines nature. Here's a quote from, um, from Shoeki. Um, remember in the, the title of my presentation, I mentioned the word ahistoricity, and I would like to focus on that idea. Um, so nature is this self-sufficient uh, realm, which is made up of spontaneous uh, energies. Here's the quote. So nature, which is Shizen, and Shoeki has us read this term Shizen. Uh, there's a footnote in one of the documents um in the uh, appendix to um to his book where he actually specifies that the two ter the two uh, ideographs should be read shizen and not jinen which was a much more common reading at the time so he says that shizen so nature is the special name of the subtle way of mutual natures but what are the mutual natures they're the spontaneous movement of the primary matter of earth which is beginningless and endless which advances and retreats to a greater or lesser degree Beginningless and endless uh, are key terms here, and I'll come back to them a little bit later. Here's another quote uh, where he talks about the, the processes uh, within this dynamic uh, world of nature. Um, they're beginningless and endless. Again, this dynamic process is the subtle way. Uh, this is the spontaneous movement of the primary matter of Earth. It cannot be taught or learned. It does not increase or decrease, which is, uh, and that is created uh, is suru uh, by itself so therefore this is called nature so nature is that which is created by itself it's a very taoist um, vision of nature and uh, again as you can see beginningless and endless this is a uh, um, a, a term that appears many many times in many instances throughout uh, shoiki's work i just selected two examples here um and i'd like to uh reflect a little bit on the meaning of uh, of this syntax of beginning endless and endless and to do that i'll refer to uh, jacques joly who um also discussed this um uh, this topic and he interprets it um uh, as you can see as a way of for shoeki to as he writes nier l'histoire 
denying history, on nie la possibilité même, de de denying the very possibility of history. And I kind of agree with this uh, with this interpretation. I have the the same feeling uh, that he's um, history is not a concern for him. It's not. It's something that is incompatible with the with the world of nature. Uh, Jolie, as you can see, uh, he also says l'histoire se trouve annihilée. So history is annihilated, basically. Um, I'm a little bit uh, unsure what to make of. Uh, Jolie's comment um, <coughs> about the uh, thing that Shoeki has in common with communist ideology. Um, I would contradict him there, but I do agree with him on this point that history is, uh, the, the, what Shoeki does is to deny the very possibility of history and, and, and as he puts it, to annihilate history. So this was about the, um, I'm still talking about the first realm, which is that of nature. And I just wanted to have a quick look at the human being within this realm, uh, where um, one of the, the terms that I mentioned earlier, uh, as in, in that Shoeki considers uh, very important in defining nature, is that of mutual natures or mutually embedded otherness, if you want. Um, and that also applies, of course, to human beings because they are a part of nature. And um, he talks a lot about, for example, the relationship between men and women. Uh, he says because they have this uh, uh, mutual natures, uh, this mutually embedded otherness, you cannot think of them as separate entities, but you have to consider them as one single entity. And that for him is the hito, that for him is the, the human being. Um, he extends that to all human beings because we are all in a relationship of, of mutual natures. And then eventually, uh, I, this is actually part of a, a, of, of a, a project that I did uh, in the past. Um, I tried to show that what Shoiki does uh, eventually is to, to propose this idea of a self with others in, in, in the sense that I cannot, um, uh, the notion of an independent self is um, basically impossible. The self can exist only with others and then he expands that to non-human the non-human uh to include animals and everything within nature and so that self becomes a self with uh, everything and this idea of the self with everything or the self with others um they're also uh really important for the point that i will try to make at the uh, at the end so i will get back to this uh, to this idea so to recap a little bit about the notion of history in um Shoeki's works so um like i said in the two realms you have two different understandings of things in the world of nature the human being is cyclical and ahistorical and all these processes of uh, human life are absorbed in the cycles of nature they don't exist independently but they are absorbed within or they are the same as the cycles of nature so we always live exclusively in a i don't know how to call it a sort of perpetual hick and nunc a, a, a here and now that is there is no um linear time uh in in the world of nature whereas in human society history is something that is rather negative it begins with the transformation of the original world of nature into the world of the private law when the sages appeared and invented their self-serving laws and by sages it means everybody from buddha to confucius to taoism and uh, shintoism and shotoku taishi and everybody they're all bad for uh shuiki to simplify so they're guilty of creating history as it were uh, so <laughs> this cyclical time of uh, human beings was actually in, for Shoik interrupted by the actions of the, the sages of old and history was born by, I don't have a better term for it, tearing time away from its natural cycle and setting it on a linear course. Uh, so for him, history is nothing more than the history of uh, humanity's infinite deviation from the spontaneous activity of nature. So. Uh, history is basically, he, he sometimes uh, uses the term yamai, uh, a, a disease, to, to re refer to this deviation from the, this and other deviations from, uh, from the way of nature. Uh, so basically for him, the, the, the gap between the forms of nature's time, this cyclical perpetual time, 
um, perpetual, uh, not time, hmm, uh, perpetual movement, and the time of human society is at the root of the human uh, predicament. We suffer in the world of private law because of history, because we created history through these laws. Now, back to deep ecology. So as I said earlier, I want to focus on these two points, point five and point six in uh, Arne Ness's list and respond to them uh, a little bit. Uh, as I said earlier, these are just uh, nascent ideas. Uh, I'm still working on them, so they might not make a lot of uh, sense right now, but hopefully you'll help me uh, refine them a little bit. So the first one, today. Uh, thinking about the term today here, uh, in within Shoiki's framework, uh, within this notion that uh, there is the, the very possibility of history is denied, is annihilated. What, do, what would that mean? So if history is annihilated and thus becomes ontologically irrelevant, then is the notion of today, as in yesterday, today, tomorrow, so the, the, the linear understanding of time. Is this, is this notion still relevant? Um, probably not, but if that's the case, then I, me, I, Doman, in this context, as a historical entity, I also become irrelevant as well. If there is no history, if it's annihilated, if it's impossible, then I, as a historical being, historically finite being, I also become an impossibility, I become uh, irrelevant. And um, to connect this to deep ecology and environmental ethics, so uh, both deep ecology, environmental ethics, um, um, environmental concerns in, in, in general, they seem to understand time as linear by default. Um, they, much like, um, everybody else in much like contemporary society. So we learned from yesterday, we did something yesterday, we learned from that, we do today for tomorrow. We protect nature for tomorrow and so on and so forth. But here's the big question, and here's the amendment that I would like to make to um, Arne Ness's point in light of Shoiki's philosophy. What if we were to change that default? What if we were to change the way we think so as not to imagine time as this um, linear thing, um, but as that sort of beginningless and endless thing that Shoiki mentions, the, that sort of perpetual here and now that he uh, alludes to in his, uh, in his work. And um, I think that would be a, a, a major ideological shift. Now, of course, if we look at environmental ethics and deep ecology, RNMS and everybody else, um, they seem to be geared toward the future. So uh, the idea is that we need to do something today in order to have a better tomorrow, in order to preserve the planet for tomorrow and so on and so forth. So the, I, I think the, the, the linear understanding of time is relatively uh, clear there. But um, my question is, what if it's not? What if we reframe everything with a different understanding where of, of things where history is not an issue anymore and time is not linear anymore but we need to re-understand everything as this perpetual uh, cycle perpetual movement where i as a historical entity am not relevant and with that i'm moving on to the last part which is trying to respond to trying to comment on the second key term which was in point number six in arnines's list ideological so um all these terms that I uh, mentioned earlier, the ones that you have here, like ecology or conservation or protection, if you look at um, the... Um, Mode in the back bedroom. Basically, all the uh, um, branches, all the, the fields in which uh, you hear this conversation, whether it's philosophy or anthropology, you hear terms like ecology, conservation or protection and so on and so forth. But the thing is, these are still anthropocentric um, attitudes. It's, um, they emanate from, from the human realm. It's us talking about ecology. It's us talking about conserving nature. And when we do that as human beings, we're actually distancing ourselves from nature. And we, uh, we imagine that we have this mm, right or this duty or this responsibility to protect it. 
Now, so therefore, placing ourselves outside of it. Now, as I was saying earlier, if Shoiki is right and history is annihilated, if I, as in singular individual, historically um, limited, historically um, contingent human being, uh, become irrelevant, and I uh, go into um, what Shoiki suggests that that self with everything where um which means that i am completely a part of uh, a part of nature that might give us some hints in trying to reshuffle the way we think about uh, environmental protection efforts or environmental ethics in uh, in general so what happens now in a lot of cases is that we take human-centric ethics or anthropocentric um, um, ethics, ethical rules or behaviors and so on and so forth, and we kind of try to expand them to the realm of nature. This is, for example, what Aldo Leopold uh, also does to a certain extent. This is what Arne Ness himself also does to a, to a certain extent. But what if we understand that our self is a self with everything and reshuffle this human centric ethics and find new ways of defining it. I have no idea how we can do that. Um, my suggestion is to listen to nature. I don't know how we can do that. Um, there are development, recent development in science that teach us a lot about the secret life of trees, for example, and uh, um, uh, fungus and birds and so on and so forth. So probably in the future, we will find ways to practically listen to nature. But I'm actually talking here about something that's not necessarily um, something that has immediate practical applicability, but more like a, a, a frame of mind whereby uh, we um, radically uh, change the way we think about um, nature in general and about environmental ethics in, in particular. And I'm done. And every time I talk about history, I like to finish with this quote um, because especially for showing time does seem to be out of joint. Thank you. 22 minutes.